Greetings to all of you. Very nice to be here. I'm very happy to be in Hong Kong and have the chance to talk to all of you. So thank you for that. Hope you are well and fine. Are you happy? Are you tired? Okay. If you fall asleep during this one, I will remember who you are. So yes, you know that. Um, we're going to talk today a lot about education. We're going to talk about learning. We're going to talk about visions and values. And we're going to talk about dreams and how to turn those dreams into reality. An education, what is that? Ultimately, an education is a set of beliefs of what it means to be human and our aspirations for the future. It is a set of beliefs of what it means to be you and it's our aspirations for the future. Maybe too seldom do we actually ask you what kind of beliefs you have. And we, as a, more of an established society, just assume that we know what is best for you and what our aspirations is all about. People that enter the Chaos Pilots are normally between 21 and 38 years old. They have an average around 23, 24. They come from all walks of life. We have people that have spent years in the military and we have people that are professional artists. We have people that have pursued an academic career and people that can barely read and write. What separates the Chaos Pilots from many other educations is that we don't accept people in based on their academic merit. They only get in based on their values and their visions. It's not so important where you're coming from, it's more important where you're going. The Chaos Pilots has an origin in the 80s. In the 80s in Denmark, Aarhus, we faced a lot of challenges. Maybe the biggest one was actually youth unemployment. And youth unemployment was met by an initiative from the municipality called the Front Runners. Front Runners was essentially a place and a space for young people to do something creatively about their time instead of ending up in a lot of problems. During the 80s, they had a lot of successes and maybe 87, around 87, 88, they were approached by a different group of people called Next. And they were asked by Next if they wanted to join a new, big, massive project. And the frontrunners, they said, well, do you have any money? And they said, no, we don't have any money. So then the, the frontrunners asked, do you have any idea that what you want to do? Well, we have an idea. We want to go to the Soviet Union. And uh, at that time, Soviet Union had a new leader called Gorbachev. And Gorbachev talked about glasnost and perestroika. And this group of people said, we're going to show him what that means. What does it mean to have glasnost and perestroika? And uh, so the front runner said, great. Do you have any legal permission to go to the Soviet Union? It had virtually been closed for 60 years. And they said, no, we don't have any permission. Well, do you have any idea what we will do when we actually get to the Soviet Union? And they said no again. And then the frontrunner said, we're all in. That spirit has followed us throughout the, the last couple of decades. A year later, approximately 2,000 young people left Scandinavia and entered into the Soviet Union, where they pursued a number of cultural and social projects. Um, after a music event on, in, in Moscow, the leader of the frontrunners were asked by Danish TV. They put a microphone in his face and they asked him, so when do you think we will see changes come into the Soviet Union? And he said, ooh, there will definitely be changes. 15 to 20 years from now, everything will be different. Four months later, the Berlin Wall came down. And for us that grew up during the Cold War in Europe, this was completely inconceivable. Who could believe that something like the whole world order would change overnight? and you didn't see it coming. You moved 2,000 people into the heart of the, the Soviet Empire, and you couldn't see that it was going to crumble. Biggest social change in, in the world since the World War II, and you didn't see it coming. Based on that, we learned a couple of different things. One is that you may need to start to pay attention to what you are actually hearing. You need to listen to your own listenings, and maybe start to focus on the weak signals instead of just downloading what everyone else has told you. Second big learning was that even though this was a massive social and cultural success, it certainly had its challenges. 
So based on that, the organizers, they asked themselves, what kind of education would we have needed in order to, su to pull such a project off? The equivalent of this project today might be that, imagine that you would bring 2,000 Europeans to North Korea. There you have the, some of the similarities. So what kind of education would you actually need in order to do that? Okay, the Chaos Pilot opened its door in 1991, and today we celebrate our 20th anniversary. The whole program is centered around today about mastering situations, mastering challenges and mastering projects. And what we have come to acknowledge is the fact that it's not enough with knowledge. Certainly knowledge is important, but it's not all. And the academic institutions pay too little attention to the other areas where it's needed. Imagine a music event. You need to know something about music. You need to know something about event making. But you also need to know something about people. You need to know how to establish and build relationships. You need to know about how to motivate people and how to build alliances. That social competence is today needed everywhere. There are far too few jobs left where you don't need social skills. Lighthouse Guard, we have two jobs like that in Denmark. Elsewhere, you need to be able to work with people. Third competence, action competence. At the Chaos Pilot, this is not a possibility to do things. It's a requirement. All things that we do have a client. All things that we train have a real-world effect. And as such, the action competence is, actually, is extremely needed. A music event again. It's not, important. it's not enough to know about music. It's not enough to, make, to have people sit around and talk and discuss. You need to make it happen. The fourth, but not the least, of our competences that we focus on is change. You need to be able to adapt. You need to be able to change your surroundings to make things happen for you. Last year, I had uh, two students that graduated. At the Chaos Pilots, it's ultimately a question of what sets you alive, what makes you come alive, where is your fire. And last um, year, I had two students that graduated as rock stars. How does, what does that mean? Well, two years ago, they did a project in China, in Shanghai. And they came to me and said, we know what we want to do now. We want to be rock stars. And they said, can we do that at the school or do we have to leave? Because we don't want to leave. And we told them that the Chaos Palace is an education where you create your own education. So your job now is to figure out how the education can support your dreams. And Mass, the singer here, he, uh, his final project was to bring about the biggest Danish tour in China ever made. So how, the question then is, how do you make a virtually unknown band without any resources, pulling off the biggest tour in the most, maybe the most important music business country in the world? And that is what they did. Two and a half years ago, I had a bit of a different student graduating. The Chaos Palace might be about what sets you alive, but it certainly is also about what projects and what leadership does this world need. Henrik Smedgaard, he, um, he was very occupied with how to produce massive social change. And Henrik um, searched for an idea. There are certainly opportunities in the world where you can place your focus if you want to do good. The question is where? Where do you choose to do it? And Henrik looked for the opportunity. So he learned throughout the education that in Denmark, we scrap 400,000 bikes every year. We throw them away. And he said, that must be an opportunity for someone somewhere. So he created an organization called Bicycle, which effectively collects these bikes and ship it off to Tanzania, where they, are, where they have created a small industry, where these bikes are being repaired remoduled and redesigned to support the infrastructure. They're used as ambulances and taxis in Tanzania. Today, he also offers a business in Copenhagen where they ran out the same, very same bikes. And that supports the initiative in Tanzania with money. But not only that, people are becoming healthy, less fat, and he has uh, reduced the pollution in Copenhagen. Last year, he was um, awarded the Social Entrepreneur of the Year in Denmark. We not only do projects that has an, a very international focus, we also do very local projects. Small projects, but that can have a very important effect in your neighborhood. Four years ago, I had a student called Morton that were very keen on doing something on how do you actually bridge the social differences 
and the growing divide between people in Denmark. Denmark might be a small country with a small population, but that doesn't mean that we know our neighbors. So he created something called Soup Day, which is effectively an, uh, an idea where people sign up to open the doors and produce soup for the neighbors. One day at one time a year. I'm not sure if it's ever going to grow out of Denmark, but it's a great idea. Last year, I also had a student uh, called Misser. Misser had a background as a social worker in Copenhagen. She worked with prostitutes and drug addicts, the toughest area in Denmark. She also was an artist, and she wanted to combine these two fields into produce good. So she created an art collective called Mr. Green, where they addressed social issues from an inspirational point of view. Instead of, for instance, talking about how climate change will destroy everything around you, they, through inspiration, through campaigns, through events, they want to inspire you to continue to do good. Okay, not everything at the Chaos Palace is so easy. Not everything goes without friction and conflict. A number of years ago, we had um, five girls that were very, very dissatisfied with the education. Basically, they went to their team leader, to their teacher, and said, you don't deliver what you have promised. That is the most threatening thing a teacher can meet. A student that says that you are not good enough. And if you're a young man and you meet five girls, five beautiful girls in their 20s that said, you are not good enough. Not easy. A good team leader, he says, this is a school where you have the opportunity to create your own education. You don't have to go to the chaos pilots. You don't got to do it. You get to do it. You are here because that you want to face these challenges. This is a school where you raise your own bars. The school is not supposed to raise the bar for you. You are supposed to do that for yourself. So if you're, not, if you're dissatisfied, you have the opportunity to create the best year throughout your education now. And the girls took on that challenge. And they went back and they took out a globe and they spun it around and they said, where this finger lands, that's where we're going. The finger landed in Sarajevo. And as some of you might know Sarajevo had at that time just uh, was still very traumatized by the civil war on the Balkan. 250,000 people had been killed and they went down there to do a good project. The question was, what kind of project? What were they going to do? So they started their action research by talking to people, meeting people, just learning about Sarajevo, learning about what is actually needed here and what can we do. Throughout that time, they learned something. Hope has left Sarajevo. The people that had any hope, they saw that hope outside Sarajevo. So those who hadn't le left, they had an idea that they were going to leave as soon as possible. You can't build a society on people leaving. Society needs capacities to stay and build their societies. So the girl said, that is our project. We want to restore hope to Sarajevo. And we're going to start with the young ones, with the children, with the kids, with the youngsters. Then they identified the youth house. The youth house has served as a beacon for the young public in Sarajevo before the civil war. And now they said, this youth house is what we're going to focus on. Unfortunately, the youth house was controlled by the municipality and the mafia. Not easy, so easy always to distinguish between those two. And um, the girls then used their natural resources. They, learned the they used their negotiation techniques. They flirted and they threatened these two parties to, in a way to get access to the building, and they struck a deal. So the, uh, the authorities said, okay, you can use the outside of the building, but you can't go in. Then the girl said, yes. And they came to think about it, something that had happened in Berlin a couple of years before. There had been an art exhibition where they had covered the Reichstag with canvases. And they said, we're going to do the same. They're going to bring down the kids and they're going to paint the future of Sarajevo and their hopes. And they're going to cover the youth house with that. They knew that the, 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 the effect of the project demanded attention, not just get people on board, but also in a way, how do you create effect that, st that stretches further down the road? So they organized uh, uh, a campaign where people came from all of Europe to help, to help out. Uh, 
and they organized a lot of PR activities and they gained a lot of media support. On the very day when this happened, I was in, in Krakow in, in Poland and I saw on German TV the, 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 the live transmission from the event. Massive success, fantastic project. Here, you could have said it's done, it's closed, you're finished. But the girl said, what kind of opportunities can come from this opportunity? How do we capitalize upon success? And that is one of the biggest questions that all of us have to face. How do we actually do that? The girls, they took down the canvases, filled it in, placed it in a car and drove it up to Norway and had a lot of artists creating artwork out of it. That artwork were placed in a museum where it was sold off as an auction. And the money that they collected, they brought back to Sarajevo and started an NGO that bought its way into the youth house. At the Chaos Pilots, we are extremely focused on leadership. A Chaos Pilots is ultimately a leader, an enterprising leader that navigates change and creates opportunities for themselves and for others. Unfortunately, we often very associate leadership with authority and the way it goes from up down, right? The leader is the one that decides over everyone else. The future of leadership lies more in how do you affect people over whom you have no authority? How do you, how do you in a way, uh, inspire and lead the people that are just beside you, your peers? And even more importantly, how do you lead your own leaders? And maybe the most important thing is how do you actually lead yourself? For many of you that are in school, this comes down to how do you actually lead your teachers? If you want to have the greatest of educations, you have to make it. The teacher can't do it. Sorry. The student can make the best teacher. The teacher can't make the best student. This is the gate that you enter into our school. It symbolizes very much the transformational process that happens when you enter into the chaos pilots. You normally enter something like this, scared, confused, what the hell is going to happen here? And you leave ideally as someone that says either I'm not coming back, I'm finished, I'm done, or someone that says this is the place I'm going to go back to work in in 10 years from now. So this is what we produce. Creative leaders that do good for others. Thank you very much.